got a word to deliver. Amen. 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 How many of y'all believe that God's put a word in you to deliver? Amen. Woo! Amen. Y'all don't believe that? You better read Jeremiah. <laughs> If you don't believe that, you better, but you better read all of Jeremiah. There's some things in there that go back and forth in Jeremiah. But if you don't believe, God has put a word in your mouth. His word. How do I know that? Because he said he wrote it on your heart. He wrote Amen. it there. It's there. Amen. You just got to get it out. How do you get it out? You start letting the word of God wash over you and cleanse off all the garbage so it can come out. Amen? Amen. 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 The rub. The rub. Talk about the presence of the Lord. Talking about walking with God. Amen? Talking about abiding with God. Jesus prayed that we would be one as the Father and Him are one. Those that follow Him, Jesus wants us to be one. He wants us to be in that perfect union together. And the intimacy that He's talking about there is the same intimacy as it is with husband and wife. Oneness. That we become one flesh, united. The only way we can do that is we have to come into Jesus. We have to come into that marriage relationship. But we can't be that nagging wife that's always complaining. Remember the Proverbs said it's better to live on a rooftop or in the desert? Then in the home with a nagging wife, and not just the rooftop, the very edge of the rooftop on the corner. The furthest possible point away from the nagging wife. That's not relationship, is it? No. That's not intimacy. If you happen to hang out on a roof around the desert, that's not relationship. All right? Whenever we allow things to come into our life, it pushes our bridegroom <coughs> away. His, he, 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 we're still sealed, we're still saved, but we push that relationship off. When we allow things to come in. Little things. Small things. And what happens, usually it starts off simple. It starts off not a big deal. We just kind of let it in because the devil's slick, right? He comes in, he's very subtle. He's very just, you know, he's smart. Right? Some of us are not so smart. You know, the devil's smart. All right? The devil comes in and he starts presenting things to you. Little things here. Little things there. Little compromises here. Little compromises there. Not a big deal. But over time, those compromises begin to build. Okay? And, they, and sooner or later they begin to get heavy. And then at some point you feel like you can't even move anymore. You can't even breathe anymore. And you're wondering, where's the presence of God? Well, you've exchanged the truth for a lie. Now that lie is weighing you down. Go back and look at Romans. The Bible said that they would change, exchange the truth. They would exchange it. They would trade it out for a lie. We've received lies into our life from television, from media. We've received lies in our life from, unfortunately, the so-called church of God. We've, we've received lies from ministers. we receive lies from religious family members. we receive lies from the world. And we just take them in. Well, that sounds really good. That must be true. Instead of getting into the truth, holding on to the truth, and verifying and backing up everything according to the truth of God's Word, we say, oh, that sounds really good. That's got to be right. That's how these cults come in and they draw people in because they're not in the Word. The cult members, if they would get in their own Word, would realize that what they believe is false. And they would walk away. The truth. But it's the little things that come in that hinder the presence of God from coming in. That push back the presence, being able to go into the presence of God. The pastor was telling, and I shared it with you, that he was going to speak at an engagement that he went to, and he had come in and he had spent time in prayer. But he said, when he was sharing, he said, I went into prayer and went in to see the presence of God, but I failed. Failed. That's not something you normally hear from a man of God saying, I failed. Well, what do you mean you failed? You know, and the, and the, the, the other person was leaving, thinking that maybe he fell asleep, or maybe you know, he dozed off, or you know, maybe something happened on the way, and we just wasn't able to spend as much time or whatever. He had the wrong concept. He was looking at it from our concept, from the United States version of what it is to enter into prayer and enter into the presence of God. Woo, we are missing it big time. Missing it big time. But he said, it, he went back and he did it again. He spent another hour, almost two hours of prayer. He said, I failed again to enter into the presence of the Lord. For him, this really bothered him. For us, we think we're doing good if we prayed, spent 15 minutes in a devotion. And we, you know, we gave God our due and we're out. The American church has been, you know, predisposed to this. And that's what we think is our religious duty. As long as we've done our religious duty, we're good. You keep doing your religious duty, you better start bringing toilet paper because that's about all it's worth. <laughs> it ain't worth what it is. You're just going through a religious act and a religious service. You're not going into the presence of God. We just saw how Samuel, in the house of the Lord... Didn't even 
can know the voice of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant was there where God's presence would come down. Samuel didn't even know the voice of the Lord. Here's the thing. The priest of the Lord missed it too. If we're not on our own as the body of Christ, each one of us, you're part of the body, each one of you are part of the, the bride of Christ. If you're not trying to enter into the presence of the bridegroom where you're becoming one, you're spending intimacy with the groom, you're missing it. What kind of relationship would you have with your spouse, those of you who are married, if you never enter into intimacy with your spouse? What kind of relationship do you have? Superficial. It looks good on paper. It looks good to the public eye. But in here, in here you're dying. In here you're hurting. In here you're suffering and you're suffocating and you're becoming weak. And the more you become weak, the more you listen to the things that are on the outside that draw you away. Those things that look good to the eye, they draw you away. Because you're not entering into the intimacy that you should be with your spouse. When you talk about marriage, Paul made it clear, you guys... Make sure you give each other your due because if not, it can cause your other to sin. God said, I want my due. Not for my sake, for yours. That you do not sin, that you're not led into temptation. But the little things. Let me tell you a story. Peter Jenkins wrote a book in 1973. It's called A Walk Across America. Old boy, to come out of a bad marriage, things didn't work out so well, and got divorced, but he said, you know what, I'm going to go find who I am. I mean, you know, sometimes you got to get off by yourself to figure out who you are. Because mm -hmm. right. there's too much noise, too much distraction, you to figure out who you are. Anyway, he goes out, and this book became a bestseller. He had an unbelievable experience. He walked 5,000 miles, just walking. It took him a little over five, almost six years to accomplish this, okay? So, before force gone. Anyway. <laughs> He worked odd jobs. He took, it took like I said, about six years to do it. He carried a 70-pound backpack with him everywhere he went. All right? When he started out, you know, he walked the Appalachian Trail. He walked through New Orleans. He walked through West Texas. He walked through the Rocky Mountains. He walked through blizzards. He walked through the desert, 120-degree temperatures. He was attacked by animals, dogs. He was bitten by snakes. He was hit by a car along the way. His dog that was started out with him got ran over by a car. His companion, along this journey, he didn't stop. He ran over by a car. He was robbed. He experienced racism. Because this was back when the hippies were still pretty prevalent. So he experienced racism. One of the families that along his way, he spent almost eight months with, happened to be a black family. And here is this white hippie. In a very racist area, they took him in and looked at him. Racism. He experienced it all. He goes through and all these things happen to him. He was, like I said, he was stabbed, he cheated. Everything he could possibly have to this guy on this journey happened to him. And he goes on. He says, and they asked him this question in, a, in an interview. He says, what in all the experiences, 120 degree blizz, 120 degree temperatures, blizzards, and on the other side of that extreme, and all kind of things came against you, what was the greatest thing that made you come the closest to giving up and stopping your walk? What would you think you would have said? The stabbings, the muggings, the temperatures, the loneliness, all the things that he experienced. You know what he answered? Sand. Sand. The sand that would get in his shoes. That little itty bitty thing that's insignificant, seemingly. But sand would get in his shoes. And we get to a point where actually it made him sick because of what would happen to his feet. His feet were completely raw because of sand in his shoes. He said, the one thing that almost made me give up my walk was sand. Those of you who went yesterday to the springs, what's the one thing you took home with you? Sand. Sand. In your shoes, on your clothes, in the baby's diapers. I mean, this stuff gets everything. How in the world did it get there? It's there. That stuff can become annoying after a while, especially when, it's one thing when you're wet, it's not too much of a big deal, but when you start drying out, you still feel that sand and it's rubbing. And it gets in your feet and it's rubbing. But think about this when it comes to your walk with the Lord. What is it that's going to come the closest to making you give up or even making some of you give up? 
It's going to be the little things that get in. The little things that you allow in. The sand. Trust me. If anything comes in that affects your walk with God, you need to deal with it. You need to deal with it swiftly. Amen. Don't allow it to linger. Do whatever it takes. Sand is difficult to get out. I mean, it seems like there's clothes. I still got sand in my pockets that have been washed numerous times. I'm still finding sand in. You got to keep working at it until you get it all out. So hold that thought in your mind. Go to Genesis chapter two. I don't mind telling stories, but I like the word of God. Amen. Amen. Whenever God created man. He created man to fellowship with him intimately. That it would not be a fight, it would not be a struggle, it would not have all these things in the way hindering, the, hindering that relationship. But he created man, and he placed man in the garden. Genesis 2, chapter 15. I'm using the Amplified this morning. Yes. Genesis 2, verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and guard it and to keep it. So the first thing he did was gave a man a job. Then, don't be lazy. Even in a perfect state, God gave man a job. Say, hey, I want you to take care of this. I want you to tend it. I want you to guard it. And I want you to keep it. <coughs> From what? You've got to take care of what you're given. Make sure nothing comes in to take. Make sure nothing is allowed in. We see Adam failed in that, didn't he? He allowed something to come in. He wasn't tending the garden. He wasn't keeping the garden. He wasn't guarding the garden. He allowed the devil to come in. We'll talk about that one in a minute. So say tend. 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 Guard. 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 Keep. 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 When it comes to your walk with God, this is something you're going to have to do, and you're going to have to be vigilant in it. You're going to have to tend it. You're going to have to guard it against whatever's out there. And you're going to have to keep it safe. And keep out things that don't need to be coming in. Some of you allow all kinds of things to come into your garden. And just like the devil, he's slick. He will tear you down. Little things. The sand. The sand. Keeps you going. Go to verse 25. Remember, he was told to tend, to guard, to keep. 25 says, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not embarrassed or ashamed in each other's presence. Say presence. Presence. They were openly exposed. They were completely transparent. There was no shame. There was no embarrassment in each other's presence. Whenever you're a husband and wife, there should be no shame or embarrassment. You come into each other's presence exposed. Boom. But not just your physical nakedness. Okay? Hear me when I say this. It should be every aspect of you when you come into the marriage relationship that is open, that is vulnerable. There should be no shame. There should be no embarrassment. It should be there because you two are to become one flesh. However, if you're holding back, you're never going to become one flesh. You're never going to have that level of intimacy that God intended for you to have you got to work at it. you got to tend it. you got to guard it to keep anything from coming in to even allow that embarrassment or that shame to hinder you from coming into that type of relationship. you got to keep it. you got to maintain it. you got to work at it. It's the same thing with your walk with God. God wants that type of intimacy with you to where you're open and you're transparent. Everything is well. He sees it anyway, but you try to cover it up. You try to hide it. You try to say, well, ah, God. And you wonder why when you pray, you don't enter into the presence of the Lord. God designed the marriage to be the perfect representation of our relationship with Him on this earth. But before you ever say, I do, to a man or a woman, you've got to be able to say, I do, to Jesus Christ, because without that, whatever I do, you do here, ain't going to work. Amen. 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 So catch it. Again, they were not ashamed. They were not embarrassed. 
Say, not ashamed. Not ashamed. Not embarrassed. Not embarrassed. If you don't allow nothing in, you don't have any reason for either of those two. That's right. Do you? But see, we allow the magazines in that tells for the women that you're supposed to look this way. That your hair is supposed to be this way. Guys, you do the same thing. You look at people on the TV and on YouTube and all these things. That you have to look like this. You have to talk like this. You have to dress like this. You have to hang out with this group of people. You have to listen to this kind of music. You've got to do all these things. But if you don't do it, now you're embarrassed. Or you're ashamed. Or you can't hang out with this group. Or you can't hang out with that group. You can't be a part of this. The church is no different. They say if you don't come in dressed this way. You don't come in talking this way. You don't come in you know, not wearing makeup or... You know, not having your hair cut and all these other things that you don't fit in. So even coming into the house of the Lord, people are embarrassed to go into the house of the Lord because of who they are. They're trying to come in transparent and open because they're broken, they're hurting, they're in desperate need, but the church is pushing them out because of their standards that don't even line up to God's standards. Somehow now they're more holy than God. God saying, I want you to come to me. Those are that you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. You come to me as you are. I will take care of the rest. Right. You ain't got to put on no show. You ain't got to get all cleaned up and come to me. I want you to come. I did the work so that you didn't have to because you can't do it. That's right. Jesus Christ went to the cross for your sin and their sin. How dare you judge anybody else? Amen. God's word will take care of the judgment, okay? There you go. Amen. Someone's living a certain way. Here you go. You love them because they're going to expect they're going to experience more from the love of God than your judgment. Amen. Your judgment will push them away. We are to be loving. We are to be kind. We are to be. And if we're in the presence of God, I promise you, the love is going to come out. Amen. The passion for people is going to come out, not just your 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 little group. Well, this is this is my four and no more. No, no, no. See, whenever the love of God gets in you, you start going out and you start loving other people Amen. that you used to not like very much. You start loving them. You can't help it. It's the love of God. He reaches out to everybody. See, whenever He came, He just didn't come for a select few. For God sent His Son to the world. The what? The world might be saved. The whole thing might be saved. Everything might be saved. But if we're going to allow the sand in our shoes, they don't be complaining about the pain they come. But if you know that it's there, then learn to get it out quickly before it becomes a problem. Amen? Amen. Go over to chapter 3. Go to chapter 3. Chapter three. Well, I love y'all. I got to understand. <laughs> The, the devil's come in. The serpent's come in. He's crafty. He's slick little boogers come in and cause problems. All right. He's, he's done to see the woman. He's done been talking to her and saying, honey, look at that tree over there. See that tree? That tree look good, don't it? That tree got some good fruit on it, huh? You know you want that fruit. That fruit's good. It, it, see that fruit? Not only does it look good, it tastes good, but you know what? It'll make you wise like God. You'll be just like God when you eat it. That's why God don't want you touching that because he knows you're going to be just like him. And it look good. Doesn't that tree look so good? Women, when y'all when y'all go to the store, why do you think they put the advertisement over the way they put it over? They don't want to catch your eye. Hmm. Oh, I like that dress. Oh yeah, they definitely get men for sure. Victoria's Secret, you see that? Yeah, they get men. They get men all kind of distracted. But see, he went to her first and touched her where she's able to be touched at. That's why. He knew if he could touch her where she gets touched at, she could touch the man where he gets touched at. Mm. What gets his strings? Mm hmm. Yeah. See, Adam was right there. Right there. While the service that run his mouth. God said, I want you to tend the garden. I want you to guard it. I want you to keep it. But the devil's there running his mouth. Instead of I saying, hey, you know what? You got to get up out of here, buddy. That ain't going to work. God said, men, if you ain't going to stand up in your house and say what God has said, then you're going to allow the devil to come in and say what he wants to say. Right. And people are going to follow that a whole lot more than they're going to follow God. Because it looks good, it feels good, it tastes good. It's desirable. It's a lie. If you're not going to speak the truth, then you're exchanging the truth for a lie. Now all this happened. Verse 7 of chapter 3 says that the eyes of them were open. Open. Now they could see what was going on. They couldn't really see, honestly. 
Because if they could have really seen, they should have celebrated what God had done. But what they saw is through the filter of what the devil wanted them to see. God made it very clear. The day that you eat of it, you will die. When you're looking through the lens of death, nothing looks the way that it should. When you're looking through that type of perspective, nothing is going to appear the way that it should. Sin brought about death and decay to every living thing. The trees, the ground, the animals, everything. Sin brought death to it. But Jesus Christ came to bring life. Amen. But catch this. Verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. See, they could still yet tell whenever God's presence was near. They could hear it. They knew the sound of the Lord walking in the garden. They knew that relationship. How many of you have experienced a relationship with the Lord intimately? Amen. How many of you have had things come in and kind of hinder that relationship to where you hear it, you hear the presence of the Lord, but now you run and hide and you have to cover yourself up because now you're embarrassed and ashamed. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence, say presence, presence, of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They hid themselves from the presence of God. Every time that you allow those things in, you begin to cover yourself up with more things that hide you from the presence of the Lord. You're not going to want to come into the presence of God. You're not going to want to draw near because you know that when you do, those things are going to be exposed. And you don't want that. I say that because I know how that feels. To have something in my life that I don't want God to expose. I'm so God, glad that God gives us the belt of truth. Amen. We get all that out there that the enemy ain't got nothing to hang on to. I ain't got nothing to be embarrassed about. Because it's all out there. So I can come into the presence of God. But the flesh will begin to tell you, no, you can't do that. The devil will begin to tell you, no, you can't do that because of this. You want to fight through it. See, God still showed up. Don't you think God knew what was going on? God knew exactly what was going on. But he still showed up to have fellowship with his creation. You're already seeing the grace and the mercy of the Lord by still showing up. We're the ones that don't like to show up. We're the ones that won't be there whenever God calls. We talked about that on Wednesday night, huh? God calls, God justifies, God glorifies. But you don't want to answer the call, you don't want to show up. See, if you answer the call, God would justify it. He would take care of it because Jesus Christ took care of it on the cross. Amen. And through that, through that justification, and that justification alone, God glorifies you. God still showed up in the garden to have fellowship. God's still showing up in the garden this morning to have fellowship. Amen? Amen. Come on. Now, I'm still here. He still wants fellowship. He's still showing up. Even right. though you come in here carrying sin, you come in here carrying all these things, God's still showing up and saying, Hey, I'm here to fellowship with you. Amen. This is my appointed time to come and fellowship with you today. I'm going to show up tomorrow to fellowship with you. And I'm going to show up the next day to fellowship with you. Are you going to listen? Or are you going to run and hide among the trees? Amen? Amen. Catch this, verse 9. I love this. This is awesome. But the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? He didn't come down with judgment. He didn't come down and said, I'm going to destroy you. He called out like someone looking for someone. Hey, where are you at? Where are you? God's calling to you this morning. Where are you? Where are you at this morning? Are you hiding among the trees this morning? You come in here, but you're hiding among the trees in here. Because you've allowed something to come in to tear you away from the presence of the Lord. You've allowed that devil to come in through some slick speech to take you away from the Lord. God's calling out to you right now and hear his voice. Where are you? So you've got to identify where you're at before you can get where you're going. So you think about even GPS, it's got to know where you are to help you get to where you're going. Look at it. Look at that. No, I want to say, when you're like, turn a location, you got to know where you're at before you can program a destination. Because if you don't know where you are, then we'll be able to tell you how to get there. 
You need to know the how to get there. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? Amen. Identify where you are. And he said, Adam said, I heard the sound of you walking in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. See, some people sometimes they come into church, but they leave out because, man, the pastor's talking about me. No. God was trying to talk to you. Amen. The pastor wasn't trying to talk about you. If he's serving the Lord and he's getting into the Lord's presence, God begins to reveal to him, he's going to declare the word of the Lord. The presence of the Lord is going to come down, and it's going to speak to you. Amen. Just as he did in the garden. Adam, where are you? His presence is going to come down. Any of the pastors talking about you, God's trying to get something to you. Amen. Because he wants to bring you back into fellowship with him. But Adam's responsible. I heard you, God, but uh, you see, there were some issues going on. See, God, I had something happen in my, at my work this week. I had something happen in my home this week. God, you know, I watched something on TV I probably wasn't supposed to watch this week, God. You know, I listened to something I wasn't supposed to listen to, God. And you know what? I was really embarrassed, so I went and hid myself from you. I couldn't come into your word this week because of what was going on. God, you know, I got angry and I was frustrated. And I didn't come into your word this week so I could get into your presence, God. I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. So I hid myself. You may not say it that way, but your actions will prove where you're at with the Lord. When he comes, when he comes knocking, your reaction will prove where you are. And God responds in verse 11. I love this. I love this. God, all the while, offered an opportunity here. Adam didn't repent. He did not repent. He pointed blame. Pointing blame and repentance are two different things. See, repentance is taking ownership for your nonsense. And tell the guy, yes, I did that. I ain't going to blame it on nobody else because I can't blame on this because it was my choice. And God, I'm asking your forgiveness. Adam never did that. All the while, God has given him opportunity. Adam, where are you? What are you doing? And Adam automatically begins to give an excuse. What happens when you get busted doing something you're not supposed to be doing? What's the first response? You're going to start giving an excuse. Kids, when your parents bust you for doing something you ain't supposed to be doing, first thing you're going to start to give an excuse. But so and so, or this happened or that happened, you're going to come up with some reasoning as to why it happened. God's not looking for an excuse. He's looking for you to take ownership and say, yes, I did that. Not pridefully, but acknowledging your fault before the Lord. And asking His forgiveness. The Bible says, if you will ask His forgiveness, He is just to forgive you and remember your sin against you no, no more. Amen. He won't hold it against you. You'll be set free. You come right back into the presence of the Lord. Amen? Amen. And He said that. God said to Adam, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? The first question he asked you. Not, he didn't ask him about the tree. I want to know where you got your revelation from. I want to know what voice you've been listening to other than mine. What have you allowed in? Who told you you were naked? What kind of nonsense has come into your head telling you that you're naked? And now you're ashamed and embarrassed. What, what is going on? Talk to me. And then he gets to the point. Have you done what I told you not to do? Have you not listened to my voice and exchanged my voice for someone else's voice? God knew exactly what was going on. God ain't no fool. You ain't going to surprise God. Oh, didn't see that coming. No. You ain't going to surprise God. God knows what you're doing. Here's the thing. He knows what you're thinking. He's in your head. God knows what you're thinking. I'm telling you, the devil likes to play up here all the time. 
I love what Pastor Ferdick says. He goes, you don't realize the struggle I go through when I'm up preaching. Because I got stuff going on in my head that I'm having to repent for as I'm preaching. Because the devil likes to come in and mess with you. And prompt you. And try to get you with the things that touch your heart and get you distracted. God says, who told you this? So you got to understand where it's coming from first before you can do something with it, right? Just like you understand where you're at before you can get where you're going. you got to understand where the crap's coming from. You need to identify the enemy. You need to identify the voice of the enemy and whatever guys he chooses to use to come into your life. Each one of you, it's probably going to be a little different. Some of us, it may be very common, maybe the same. But you need to identify the doorway he's using and shut that joker. Amen. And lock it tight and cover it with the blood of Jesus so he can't come back in. Amen. But if you're going to keep leaving the door open for him to come on in, quit complaining. That's on you. That ain't on God. Just like Adam, he started to blame, well, it's the woman that you gave him. It's her fault and your fault, God. Well, see, God, if you hadn't made her so beautiful, I wouldn't have received what she gave me. God, if you hadn't made him looking so good, coming and talking so smooth, I wouldn't have listened. So you're going to give God an excuse as to why you did what you were very clearly told not to do. See, the bad thing about it wasn't even that. Eve added to what God said, don't do. Only God says, don't eat it. He said, well, he said, don't eat it, don't touch it. How are you going to tend the garden if you don't touch it? <laughs> I'm looking at it. I'm thinking about it. Come on! <laughs> Nothing's changing. I told you to tend it and take care of it. Oh, I, yeah, you got to get your hands dirty. you got to do something. But see, when you start adding to God's word, that's when God will come in and prove you a fool. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So again, the sand in your shoe, the bomb, it will cause you to quit. It will cause you. How quickly did the, the, the creation get out of fellowship with God in His presence? How quick? How many of you, when you accepted Christ, you felt His presence, you were in His presence, how quick did the sand get in your shoe and you stepped back from your relationship with God? Truth in that. Go to uh, Song of Solomon, or Song of Psalms, depending on how your Bible translates it. Songs of Solomon or Psalms? Song of it says Song of Psalms or Song of Solomon. Oh, okay. okay. Depends on your translation. Chapter 2. Mm. It's, a, it's a beautiful story. Chapter 2, Song of Solomon. Solomon, apparently, out of all his wives, had one that he really loved. He should have forsaken the rest and loved this one, but he didn't. And we probably saved him a lot of issues. But there was one that Solomon loved. And he, there's this love song going back and forth between husband and wife. It's absolutely beautiful. But I like what she says to him in verse 15. Take a look at this. Psalm of Psalms, verse 15. i got to look at the Amplified because, again, there's some stuff in there. The way the Amplified pulls it out is beautiful. But it's powerful. It's right after Ecclesiastes. Which is right after Proverbs. Which is after Psalms. Which is after Job. Um, two. Verse 15. I love this. Again, they're going back and forth describing each other. They're going back and forth talking about each other's body and the way they look. And they just loving on each other. It's, just, it's a beautiful picture. But catch what she says to him. My heart was touched, and I fervently sang to him my desire. Take for us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards of our love, for our vineyards are in blossom. It's beautiful. Man, our love for each other is at its peak. It's absolutely amazing. It's fragrant. It's beautiful to look at. It smells nice. You just want to be there all the time. It sounds like God's presence, don't it? Amen. It's fragrant. It's peaceful. It's life-changing when you come into God's presence and you just want to be there all the time. Amen. But the bride is singing out to her love. But catch the foxes that come in and take that away. That's right. 
that spoil it? What little fox has come into you, your life that is spoiled? Who killed? <laughs> what has come in and killed that for you? What little fox has come in and spoiled your vineyard while it was in blossom? You're thinking, man, we're like right there then. Ring, hello. Oh, look at the TV. What's on the TV? Oh, what's this? Oh, what's, what's happening on Twitter? What's happening on Kick? Instagram, what's happening? All these little things come in and they distract us. They're innocent in nature. They're really neither good nor bad, are they? It's technology. It doesn't have a soul. It's neither good nor bad. What motivates it and what motivates you is a whole other story. Because you do have a soul. Yep. You do have an enemy of your soul that's trying to come against you and keep that from God. Amen. What little fox are you keeping allowing in to take the blossoms to keep things from blooming and coming into a harvest in your life? You allow something to come in and hinder the presence, you're not going to get the harvest. That's right. Amen. You're not going to receive the fruit of your labor. You're going to be laboring in vain. The pastor said, I failed. I failed to enter the presence of the Lord. What little fox snuck in? This was an intentional act. Take them. Capture them. Stop them. Do whatever it takes. See, we build up walls and defenses against the big stuff that we see. It's the little stuff that sneaks in and gets you. If you're going to build up a wall, make sure it ain't got no gaps. Amen. Make sure it ain't got no holes. I don't like what the comedian says. A hedge? Is that the best you can do? A hedge of protection. Man, this gap's all in that. But when this, the Word of God is your protection. The Bible says He is a strong tower. And the righteous run into Him and they are saved. Amen. They are delivered. Not just saved, but delivered. See, when Peter cried out to the Lord, he ran into his presence. He was in the process, but then a fox got in the way, distracting him, began to sing, and he cried out to the Lord. And God said, okay, I got you. Delivered him out and put him back where he's supposed to be. Take it into captivity. What do you mean take it into captivity? Look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, chapter 10. Again, all this is an intentional act. When you come into the presence, it has to be intentional. You have to be purposeful in it. You have to be going after that goal and nothing else. And you have to make sure that whenever you're about this, that you don't allow distraction to come in. And if you've got some foxes, you better tie those doors up so they don't take away what's going on. <coughs> Starting in verse 4. Okay. Again, like I said, whenever you come into the presence of God, it, it will be a fight because of your flesh. Because of the things in your life that you allow in. How many of you have ever tried to catch a fox? Those jokers are quick. They're agile. You ever tried to catch a fast dog? Even Mel is difficult to catch. She's about the size of a fox, just less fur. That's hard to catch, right? It's going to take work to do this. So whenever the bride's singing to her husband, hey, catch these jokers, she say, look, I don't want you to be a lazy man. I don't, I don't want you to be the one that just sits back on the dove and hopes something happens to him. You get your behind out there and get them going because we can come into each other, honey. <laughs> Things are good. Oh, she knew what she was going for. Don't you think she did? Read the rest of the book. <laughs> she knew what she was going after. And she said, I don't want no distractions when we get to our time, baby. <clears throat> you better turn the TV off. You better turn the radio off. You better turn everything. You better lock the door. You better shut it down. I don't want no distractions when it's our time. God said, I don't want no distractions when it's our time. Amen. When it's our time of intimacy, I don't want no distractions. You better shut it down. God said, be still and know that I am God. Amen. Cease from doing. Turn it off. 
These things have remotes. These things have power buttons. Shut it down. This right here, your mind has one too. It's called the Spirit of the Lord. That will begin to pray for you when you know not how. When you are weak in your strength, God said He would do it for you. Amen. Shut it down. How do I come into the presence of the Lord? Shut it down. Shut everything else down. If there's sin, confess it. Give it to the Lord. But honor God first. Give Him glory. Honor who He is. See, all the while she's talking to her husband, she's building him up. She's talking about how good he is, how wonderful he is, how beautiful he is, how amazing he is. There ain't a man in this room that ain't going to want to be praised. Every man in this room, before you like sex, you like honor. Hear me? Before a man wants intimacy, he wants to be honored. Period. If we're the bride of Christ, hello, what do you think God wants first? He wants the honor before you're going to get the intimacy. Oh, that's deep. That's rich right there. Y'all need to chew on that one. Before the intimacy with the Lord, He wants the honor that He's due. Some of y'all want to get that later. But verse 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of the flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction. <laughs> Love to have destruction of strongholds. What's a stronghold? That's the place that the enemy digs in and you ain't getting to it. That's what they were called. That's a highly defensible place. Some of y'all play the war games on Xbox and PlayStation all that stuff. Y'all sit there trying to kill everybody. Y'all try to find out one place and y'all get ticked off because y'all call them camping out. No, no, no. They found a stronghold and they can take you out. You're just ticked because you're getting killed. No, they were smart I found a stronghold that they could get to to take you out. Don't you think the devil's going to do the same thing? Oh, yeah. He's a master tactician when it comes to warfare. He's going to find that stronghold that he can get into and try to take you out. And think about strongholds. Usually there's only room for one or two. It's not a very big place. It's enough so one person can get there and stay there and defend it well. What do you think the devil does in your life every time he brings a little piece of sand in? I think I still got sand in my shoe trying to get out from weeks ago. Little pieces that get ground in. And they get in there. It's hard to get them out. You can wash, you can rinse, man. You can do whatever. You can power wash these things sometimes. And I think the sand just goes further down. <laughs> but it says that. But the mighty, what? The weapons of our warfare are not physical, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and the destruction. Not just clean out. The overthrow and desolation, decimation, done, gone, strongholds that enemy has in you. It says, inasmuch as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. What was the true knowledge of God back in Genesis? Don't eat the tree. The devil comes in, but the tree looks good. The tree's desires for wisdom. It's good for these things. It'll make you like God. Truth of God. Simple, small, don't eat it. Lie of the devil, full of nonsense. It's interesting. That when you look in the spiritual realm, it don't take much for God to thwart an enemy of greater size. Get in, 300 men. How many did he take out? Locked. The odds were ridiculous. 300, what, 30,000? 300 men took out 30,000. These are trained warriors. 300 men because of God. Amen. It don't take much. One puts how many to the flight? Then two puts how many to the flight? And then three? God's ratio is a little bit different than ours. It don't take much for us to come in to the presence of the Lord and cast out every stronghold. This in your life. But what does it say? Everything. We refute it. We stand up against it. We fight for it. Everything that would stand up against the true knowledge of God. Are you willing to fight for it when you hear lies? Are you willing to fight for it when you hear things that are contrary to the Word of God? Is this contrary to the Word of God? I'm sorry, it's a lie. Now, is there truth outside the Word of God? Yes. 
There's doctors out there that know how to work the inner workings of the body. There's mechanics out there that know how to work cars. There's truth to what they're saying. But the truth, the one truth, the eternal truth is this, because cars are going to break down. The body's going to break down. God ain't breaking down. Amen. He made it very clear. Every punctuation mark, every little piece that God put in His Word will remain. Everything else will pass away. But every aspect of who God is will remain the same, no matter what. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We need to make sure that we are setting up and bringing these things down, refuting them. It says what? And we lead every thought. Say every thought. Every and thought. And purpose. Say purpose. Purpose. Away captive into the obedience of Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Amen. We lead. We take authority over. Are you catching this? We're the ones that step with the way. Devil, shut your mouth. That's enough. You will go no further. You take it captive. You place that joker in chains. Not you. You're the, you've been set free. Amen. Take the chains that are on you and give them back to the enemy where they came from. That's right. We have been given the power to bind and to loose. God gave us that as His children, as His disciples. I'm giving you the power to do this. But if you don't believe that, then it ain't going to work in your life. But when you do believe that, and your faith is stirred up, then when you begin to declare things just as God declared things into existence, guess what's going to change in your life? Amen. You're speaking with the power and the authority of God that's in you. Things will change around you. It has to. It is not optional. That's because that's who God is. But you have to take every thought and purpose. Because thought leads to purpose. Thought leads to intention. Whenever attention starts beginning to happen, it leads to sin. Whenever sin comes to its full birth, it leads to what? Death. See, the thought was planted in Eve's mind, hey, take a look at the tree. But the first thing she was asked, has God said? Well, no, it's what God said, but that's, is that what he meant? There's a depth to God that is rich, and it is deep. And the Holy Spirit will reveal the depths of Him and who He is. That's why you can go over passages over and over and over again, and God will begin to pour out more and more of who He is. But when you're just starting out, take it for what it says. Until the Holy Spirit begins to get in you and starts to reveal more depth, you have to take every thought and every purpose captive. And to the obedience of Christ. You make it submit to the obedience of Christ. Through the power of Christ in you. There you go. So again, none of this is about you. It's all about Jesus. It's all about His presence in your life. But how do we do that? I'm so glad you asked. Because I know that thought was just weighing on your mind. Pastor, how do we do that? Go to 1 Peter. How do you believe that altars are important? Amen. How do you understand altars invite the presence of God to dwell in a place and stay there? Amen. Okay. Who tends the altars? We do. We do. Who? What? We do. we do. Who are we? Priest. The priest. Okay. Now let me let me explain something there on priesthood. Okay. There's the priesthood in the body of Christ, which is the elders, which is men. Okay. There's that type of priesthood. But there's also the priest that service and do service in the kingdom of God, which is every child of God. How do I know that? Let's look at the scripture. Chapter 2, starting in verse 9. Look at this. How do you bring captive? How do you take authority over? How do you do these things? But first of all, inviting the presence of God into your life. If there's no presence, there's no power. Did you catch that? No presence, no power. Verse 9 says, but you, say me. Say me. Me. Say me. Me. Say me. Say I. I. I am. Am. Okay, hold that thought. I am. You 
are a chosen race. You have been chosen. If you are a child of God, you have been chosen. Say, I have. I have. Let's try it again. Say, I have. I have. Oh, there we go. Now we're getting a little bit more bold about what we're saying. Declare it. Been chosen. Been chosen. Try it again. Been chosen. Been chosen. Been chosen. All right. That's not somebody's name. All right. I have been chosen. This is whenever the devil starts coming in and starts lying to you and telling that you're a nobody, beginning to question whether you're a child of God. So, oh, oh, hold on, devil. See, the, the Bible tells me the word of God says, as Jesus, it is written. See, devil, I have been chosen. I have been chosen. So, devil, you can lie to me all you want to. I have been chosen. Amen. Oh, it also says, a royal priesthood. Say, I'm a royal priesthood. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm a dedicated nation. I'm a dedicated nation. You're catching the scope of this. A race. Not only a race, but a royal priesthood. Not just a priesthood. Is it fair to say there's priests around? There's other priests of other altars around. But see, that, that, that's the common. We're royalty. We've been a royal priesthood. Under the authority of the king. That makes us what? Prince and princesses under the king. Amen. Join heirs with the son of the living God. Amen. Amen. A dedicated, dedicated, set apart for a purpose. You as a child of God have been set apart for a purpose. Nation. See, we're not just an isolated group. There's a whole bunch of us. Okay, you look across the nation of America, there's a bunch of different personality types, there's a bunch of different people, the way they look, the way they talk, the way they sound, the things they do. But, it says what? We're a dedicated nation. All of us together, all the differences, all the, as long as we declare who Jesus Christ is and we back up on the fundamentals of who God is, yep. we're a part of that nation. It doesn't matter what title you have on the outside of the door. It doesn't matter what you say you are, we're a part of what the Bible says. We're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, and a dedicated nation. Amen. God's own purchased, special people purchased. We were paid for with a price, not just gold and silver, which can be taken, but it was the blood of Jesus Christ, which was willingly shed for you. Jesus said, you don't take my life from me. In the world's eyes, they, they conquered him. And Jesus said, oh, no, no. See, you've got a misinterpretation of what's really happening here. I lay my life down willingly. You ain't taking it from me. He told me, you have no authority over me. Except which my father says you can have. See, the devil has no authority over us. Except what daddy says he can have. And the thing is, we're a child of God. When we begin to cry out to the father, the father says, okay. My child spoke, that's enough. God steps in through Jesus Christ, the devil, that's enough. When you begin to cry out to the Lord, when you begin to speak as a child of God, the devil has to get back. Amen? Amen. Now, that you may set forth the one... What? That, let's read that one. That you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfection of him who called you. So who's supposed to do all that? Me. Say hi. Hi. And the eyes have it. Ta-da. You're chosen by God. You're a royal priesthood. You've been set apart for His work. You've been purchased by the blood of Christ. You're a special people. Hallelujah. Mm. I'm going to tell y'all, say y'all special, but y'all might get a big head if I say y'all special. Say y'all special. <laughs> but the Bible says it. Daddy says it. But you're supposed to set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of Him who called you. How well are you doing in this department? How well are you showing forth the wonderful deeds of God and displaying the virtues of God, the likenesses of God in your life? How are you showing that forth? Because if it ain't the presence of God, then it's not the virtues of God. Amen. That's right. You catch that? If it ain't the presence, then it ain't the virtue. But it says, what did he call you out of? Called you out of darkness... 
into his marvelous light. Where the light is, darkness cannot stay. Notice that he called you out of it. Some of y'all like to tiptoe back into it. Let me go hide in the trees. Let me go back to that thing I'm comfortable with. Let me keep playing with that sin that I know is going to kill me. And then when God shows up, you're like, oh, you're now embarrassed and ashamed again. But see, we have the ability to come boldly into the throne room of grace. Throne room of grace. What is grace? <laughs> Oh, that's mercy. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Deserve. You can come boldly into getting that thing which you do not deserve, which because of sin is God's presence. But you can come in because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. When you get that concept that you rely on that concept and you draw into it and you press into it and you fight to get into it. Man, have you ever seen people that just, they're doing everything they can. You get a wild animal corner, that animal will do whatever it takes. Bite, scratch, whatever it's got to do to get out of that situation. Right, try to baptize a cat, right? Thinking about a joke I heard Pastor say it was pretty funny. I can tell right now that it's pretty funny. That hasn't But how will you fight to get into the presence of God? Will you give it everything you got? <coughs> or when it gets tough, you're just going to quit because it got tough. Sometimes when you're dealing with the Lord, you can't stop when it gets tough. When it causes pain. When it gets difficult. I was in a sparring match and had my shoulder dislocated. I relocated it, put it back where it's supposed to be, got back up and finished the fight. Anybody that's ever had their shoulder dislocated knows how that feels. You don't want to get back up and fight. You don't want to get back up and throw punches with a shoulder that's been put out of place. You don't want to stop because that hurts. It's painful. It's distracting. It's almost disorienting because of the amount of pain that it causes. He said, the only thing that ever made me want to give up was to stand in my shoes. Not being stabbed. Not being run over by a car. Not losing his dog because it was run over by a car. Not being robbed. Not being suffering in the weather. Both degrees. He said, no. It was a little thing in my shoe that made me want to quit. It's that little sin that I let in that made me want to quit. It's that little fox that I allowed in that messed up the loving embrace of my Savior, of my groom, my husbandman. It's that little fox that got in and caused me problems. You have to be intentional about what you're doing for the Lord with the purpose of inviting His presence. Not getting everything else, His presence. When His presence comes, everything else falls into place. Amen. The blessings come. The ground bringing forth its fruit comes. Whenever you get into His presence, the marriage heals. When you get into His presence, the finances change. When you get into His presence, the physical changes. It has to get right before God because God intended it to be a certain way. Amen. And when His presence shows up, it has to get back that way. Amen. Why do you think that it will? Thank you, Jesus. Why do you think that it is that the Bible says that no flesh shall stand before God and live? It's because of the sin. Whenever it was in the perfect state, God come and did what? He walked with them. And they were not destroyed. But whenever sin came in, they hid themselves. And God said, oh, i got to clothe you. I gotta cover you up now because of this. I gotta hide you. Told Moses, I gotta hide you in the cleft of the rock. And I'm just gonna let the backside of my glory pass in front of you because you cannot see me and live. Whenever God used to walk in the garden. But see, now because of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, we can come back into the right relationship and walk with the Father. And God will begin to restore the land. When my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and turn 
from their wicked ways. Take captive those thoughts and purposes that are against God. Bring them under the authority of Jesus Christ and begin to walk in it. God said, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. Why? Because God wants to show who He is. God likes to show off. Yes, He does. Because He's God. And He can. And nothing can stand against that. God likes to bless His kids because it brings Him glory. He's not going to bless a disobedient child. He will give you common grace that He gives everybody, sinner and saint alike. But when His children come into His presence, then there's that special grace, those special gifts, where you see things happen that they cannot be explained by science or any other knowledge because it comes against the true knowledge of Jesus Christ. Special grace. That's why I said all of creation, you look at Romans, is groaning and waiting for the sons of God to be revealed that we can take our rightful place and take this land back from the enemy. They take back the deep. God said, I already got it. I got the keys. But you let him rent, rent free in your place. Evict him. Kick him out. Don't allow him back in. Some of you all got to make some changes in your home. Come on. And what you watch. And what you listen to. And what you allow in. God blessed you with it. Keep it clean. Honor. Give God glory. Remember? Honor before intimacy. You have to honor God. Our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. That's it. His way of doing things. His mind. His heart. His passion. I knew you before I formed you in the womb. I ordained you. I called you. I set you to a purpose. I put my word in your mouth. Do what I tell you to do. God will honor. He will bless. And you will see His mighty hand work. Amen? Amen. And we'll stand.